In a world where we experience economic turmoil, grief, poverty, and crime, we are not consumed by the flames, but rather we use those flames to light our path toward a brighter future. Through our faith, we learn to receive the strength and resilience we need to survive and thrive in the midst of life's greatest challenges. So let us be like the fire that burns hot and bright, never letting the world's darkness extinguish our inner flame. Let us draw upon the unshakable resilience that comes from Jesus alone and emerge from the trials of life stronger and more resilient than ever before. Well, this is the final week of our series called The Resilient, and so glad that you're here. Those of you here in the room, those of you on our Skagit campus, those of you online, and those of you online, what do you think of Pastor Brian's haircut? Doesn't he look sharp? Really sharp haircut for the summer. Good to have you with us. We've been looking over the last seven or eight weeks of these wisdom lessons from Babylon and finding things from lessons from Babylon that we can apply to our lives so that when we go through difficult times, we can learn what they exemplified and help us to be more resilient. We started this series off a couple weeks after Easter, looking at kind of this double vision that kind of the Stockdale paradox where, where you confront the brutal facts of what you're going through, but at the same time, you never lose sight of the fact that you will prevail in the end. And then we talked about identity and who we are and whose we are and the identity and how we see ourselves really changes and, and, and directs the decisions we make and how we uh, confront difficulties in our life. In the third week of the series, Pastor Brian talked about the greatness of God in the midst of trials and hardships. Fourth week, we looked at the importance of community, of having brothers and sisters surrounding you in those difficult seasons. And then that next week, we saw the invisible hand of God, the sovereignty of God that is up to something in Babylon and that he is working things out. And then Ryan Fasani was here talking about really one of the enemies of resilience is our blindness and numbness. And then last week, we talked about the superpower of gratitude and thankfulness in the midst of our trials. And what was interesting, I wasn't expecting this kind of a side effect of last weekend's sermon, is last week, I had several different texts and emails and cards saying, Pastor Bob, I just want you to know that I'm thankful for you. I'm like, oh, I, mean, I, just, I wasn't like doing that to get thanks. But, and then I remembered that I challenge you to be thankful for imperfect gifts. <laughs> and I remember these four words, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, I see that, a hand, amen, hallelujah. Yeah, and so, yes, here I am, your imperfect gift, you're, you know, it could be worse, pastor. My name's Pastor Bob, I'm your imperfect pastor. It could be worse. It reminded me of my mom and dad. My dad was an amazing preacher, communicator, unbelievable. My mom could hold her own as well. And very often when my dad would go somewhere to speak or to preach, they would ask mom to introduce him. And she would often quote Psalm 84, chapter, verse 11, where it says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And she said, and I have spent my life trying to walk uprightly, so I'd like to introduce to you my no good thing. And, and then he would come out. So, so today I'll be your no good thing, your it could be worse pastor, your imperfect gift. But we've been looking at these lessons from Babylon and not so much from the Babylonians, a little bit, but more from the exiles. The people who had been stripped from their homes in Judah and had been taken against their will to a foreign country with a pagan God and foreign language and foreign culture, and they were stuck there as prisoners, and they would be, most of them, for the rest of their lives. And we have to be really careful that we don't romanticize their experience in Babylon. While it was in Babylon, in the hanging gardens of, of, you know, of Babylon and, and Nebuchadnezzar and the Euphrates River, it must have been a spectacular city. It's not where they wanted to be. And yes, God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah and told them, you're going to be there for a while, 70 years. So build homes for yourself, plant gardens for yourself, get married, have children, let them get married when they're old enough and they'll have children, you'll have grandchildren. And we can say, well, it was a wonderful experience and it wasn't altogether bad, but it's not where they wanted to be. It's not where they would choose to be and they were not free to leave. And you can understand the sorrow and the heartbreak and the pain, maybe even the confusion and the anger of being somewhere away from home. As I was thinking about what they must have felt, I was reminded of that, that kind of that course, close to the very end closing scene of The Sound of Music. Some of you are familiar with The Sound of Music, where the von Trops are getting ready to leave Austria because the Nazis are gonna take over, or taking over. 
and they're planning to leave and the Nazis have this concert and they want them to sing these wonderful songs of the Von Trapp family. And as they're preparing to leave, knowing that they may never come back to Austria, they close the concert as Captain Von Trapp comes out and he sings out a beautiful ballad, Edelweiss. And that last line, bless my homeland forever. They may never come back. Well, those who were in exile in Babylon had their own Edelweiss moment. And one of the exiles wrote this song. We find it in Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Bless my homeland forever. The thing that makes it even more sad as if this whole thing could have been avoided. The exile didn't have to happen. In fact, God had warned them, had sent prophets to say, listen, you've gotten off track. You're, you're following you know, pagan gods. You're worshiping idols. You've, you've left the covenant. If you don't get back on track, I'm gonna have to, to rein you back in and there's gonna be this exile. He had warned them. He had sent the prophets one after another and not just a couple of weeks before. A hundred years before he was saying, and God is this long-suffering God, this patient God, this gracious God who would give chance after chance, every chance possible. And yet they would not get back into a right relationship with God. And so in his desire to restore them to the life he's created them to live, he allows Babylon to take them into exile. And what makes matters even worse is that there was a remnant of faithful people, people that remained true to Yahweh, people who still followed the Torah. And these faithful few, they were punished as well. They were taken to exile and reap the consequences of the rebellion of the nation. And in the midst of that injustice, in the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of that that exile, God continues to send his prophets. Now, as we've talked about in the past, the prophets spoke, they were the mouthpiece, they spoke on God's behalf to the people. Priests would speak to, to God on the people's behalf, but the prophets would speak God's word. They were the mouthpiece for God to the people. And usually their message was a corrective one because the prophets would come because they had gone off track. They had, they had strayed, they had left the covenant and the prophets would always tell them, get back or there's gonna be some consequences. And we have a tendency to kind of just summarize the message of the prophets of turn or burn. And in essence, that's kind of what it was. However, when the prophets came speaking for God, they didn't come in a posture of anger and judgmentalism and a threat. It was not that at all. It was quite the opposite. It was a warning from a caring heart, a loving heart, a longing, an invitation, a pleading, get back into a right relationship. This doesn't have to happen. And what we find during the time of the exile is that God would continue to send the prophets and sometimes they were corrective messages. But there were also these prophetic words of hope, words that would inspire, words that would encourage Words that would bolster their spirits. Words that would put wind beneath their wings, as it were, to lift their hearts and to know that, that there, is, there is something better and to help them to be resilient. We understand this. I mean, you know, there have been times when whatever circumstance or valley you're in and someone comes along and just says the right thing, not a cliche, not a little platitude, but they just said the right thing and it was just enough to give you a little bit of a lift in your spirit, just to encourage you. Uh, Julius Siegel in his book, Winning Life's Toughest Battles, The Roots of Human Resilience, he talks about how words can just encourage and help people to be resilient. In the first week of the series, we talked about Admiral uh, Jim Stockdale and the Stockdale Paradox, and he had been a POW in a Vietnamese POW camp. Well, 
Siegel uh, talks about this kind of a situation and with specifically with James Stockdale. He writes this, no communication between prisoners was tolerated. Few captives suffered more than Vice Admiral James Stockdale, who served 2,714 days as a prisoner of war. On one occasion, his captors shackled his legs and arms and left him lying in the sunshine for three blistering days while guards beat him repeatedly to keep him from falling asleep. How would a person survive? I mean, how, do you, how, do you, how do you become resilient in that? After one beating, Stockdale heard a towel snap. The towel was snapping out a code that the POWs had devised. It was a message he would never forget. Just five letters, G-B-U-J-S. God bless you, Jim Stockdale. If one man walked by another man's cell, he would drag his sandals to code a message and send it to him. Men sent messages to their comrades with the noises they made by shaking out their blankets, by belching, by snoring, by blowing their noses, and by making other bodily noises that would be better left unmentioned, but which are normally mastered by 10-year-old boys. <laughs> Sending messages of encouragement. There's just something about these words that will lift you up, that will give you the strength, that will see you through, that will bolster your strength just to be a little more resilient. And the prophets came along with these messages so that while they're in exile, while they're in Babylon, while they're in a difficult season, they could be living with a transcendent perspective, that the words would somehow rise their eyes above their current reality, lift them beyond Babylon and the circumstances. I mean, think about Daniel. Daniel, his name, Daniel, means God is my judge. And he keeps holding on to that name, Daniel, even though Nebuchadnezzar in, in Babylon had given him a different name, Belteshazzar. He held on to Daniel. God is my judge. Not like, uh-oh, here comes a judge. He's watching and he's going to condemn me. No, God is my judge and he will set things all right one day. He will bring about justice. And there were these words that just brought hope and encouragement in the difficult dark seasons so they could be resilient. So today as we finish out this whole series, what I want to do is I want to look at three words from three prophets that give us hope and encouragement. We'll look at three different prophets that came during the season of the exile and some of the messages that they brought, messages that would allow the exiles to be more resilient. But I don't want this to be something that we study from something that happened 2,500 years ago. I want these messages to be not just for the exiles in Babylon, but for us. And so when we get to whatever, you know, the, the con condensed version of this, the fill in the blank, it will say you, because I want this for us. We're going to look at three different prophets, two of which we've looked at throughout this series, one of which we have not. We'll start with the one that we haven't even mentioned in this series. It's the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel, his name means God strengthens. His friends probably called him Zeke, and his stage name was E-Z-E, -E, yo. But Ezekiel writes this book. Now, if you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, you probably end up scratching your head because the book of Ezekiel is flat out weird. He has these dreams and the symbolism and the bizarre things that he writes in that. And then he does these illustrated sermons with these antics that are just strange. But he writes this book and he's a prophet during the exile. Ezekiel 1.1 says this, in the 30th year, in the fourth month on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, many people believe this was actually his 30th birthday. Some of your Bibles may have an asterisk or a letter or something that goes down and says, during my 30th year. Some think this was on his 30th birthday down at the Kibar River. It was a major tributary to the Euphrates. Maybe he's having a, a river birthday party, but he's down at this river in exile and the heavens are opened and he begins to see these visions, and they are odd. In fact, if, if my description of the book of Ezekiel has you a little bit curious, might I suggest, before you read the book of Ezekiel, go online and watch the Bible Project's two seven-minute videos to give you an overview of the book. It will help you understand it a lot. But he starts writing down these visions that he has. 
And the things that he does to illustrate, like cutting off his hair and tying himself up and eating food cooked on a fire with questionable fuel and, and just a whole bunch of stuff. But his message is basically a bad news message. It's usually what the prophets brought. The message was this, that the people of Israel had hardened their hearts, that they had rebelled from God, they had become evil, they had strayed, and they were spiritually bankrupt. Now, one of the good things, if you think about bankruptcy, in a bad situation like bankruptcy, there's, there's hope if you file chapter 11, you can restructure and go forward. Interesting thing is he paints this picture of the spiritual bankruptcy of Israel in chapter 11. He begins to give this little picture that it's not over yet, that there's hope. Ezekiel eleven sixteen says this. Therefore say, this is from the Lord, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. He's reminding them, as we've seen before, you know, in the exile into which I have carried you. He's not abandoned them. He didn't send them and leave them and say, see in 70 years. He goes with them. And while they're away from Jerusalem and while they're away from the temple, he is the sanctuary for them in their exile. And as he says this, it's not just, well, you're in this situation and this is as good as it's going to get. I'm there with you. I've been with you the whole time. And then he gives an even better picture, a glimmer of hope beyond. And that is this message for them and for us is that you will have a future hope. You will have a future hope. Your current condition is not the end of the story. It's not the final chapter. It's a difficult scene, but it's not the end. So it continues on in Ezekiel 11, verse 17. Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. That's why they're in exile, because they've been involved in pagan idolatry. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep all my laws they will be my people, and I will be their God. That was the design from the very beginning. When he called them to be separate, to be holy unto him, that they would be his people and he would be their God. And they were straying from that right and left, and he's the one that's always faithful. And he says, and there will come a day when the spiritual bankruptcy will go away, when there will be a new heart, there will be a new spirit, there will be the re re renewed covenant again. Let me take some of you back to 1978 when Peaches and Herb sang, reunited and it feels so good. Best song ever written in 1978. Well, except for anything the Eagles put out. But regardless, God is saying to them, we will be reunited. This is what I long for. So Ezekiel writes this with this glimmer of hope to encourage them that, that things will get better. Well, through his book, he continues to write about the truth and the judgment on Israel, the judgment on other nations. But at the end of the book, he again turns the corner and he begins to paint this picture of what the future will look like. When there's a new leader, like a King David, this messianic one that will come, there'll be like a new temple, like a new kingdom. And then again in chapter 36, he repeats that beautiful line, I will take from them their heart of stone and give to them a heart of flesh. And then in chapter 37, there is this scene that Ezekiel sees, and it is written, and it is made for a movie. He finds himself in this valley, and the valley is just filled with these bones, skulls, femurs, tibias, all of these hip bones, and everything's out here in this valley. Closest thing I've ever seen to this, there's a place in the catacombs in Rome called the Church of the Bones. And somewhere in the 16th, 17th century, 
they began to take the monks and when they would die, they would put their bones and you walk in this place and there's 4,000 skeletons, skulls and all these bones. It's a little creepy, kind of weird, kind of cool at the same time. So he finds himself in this valley and the whole valley, the floor is completely covered with bones. This is where that old song, them bones, them bones, them dry bones comes from. The foot bones connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bones connected to the shin bone. We won't go through the whole thing, but you know the song. Uh, more recently, um, Elevation Church, I think, wrote a song called Rattle. This, this little side note, you want to hear a really great version. Zach Williams does a version of Rattle where he, he samples in part of Stephen Furtick's sermon from uh, Ezekiel 37. Great one. Pull that up on your, on your streaming device and listen to that one. But it's this picture of all of these bones. Now, the picture that God is trying to say to, to Ezekiel and to Israel is this valley of dry bones is a picture, it's a visual metaphor of the spiritual condition of my people in Israel. They are not just corpses. There is no life whatsoever. Spiritually speaking, there's no flesh, there's no muscles, there's no sinews, there's no tendons. It's just bones, just dry bones, lifeless bones, no sign of life whatsoever. And that's the spiritual condition of Israel. But it's not where it ends. He says, this isn't the dead end, the finish. Because these bones will live again. And then we read in Ezekiel 34, starting at verse 6. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. It is a beautiful picture of redemption. God has not given up on them. He hasn't abandoned them. He hasn't forsaken them. He still has a plan that their life would be filled with vitality in a right relationship with him. It's a beautiful redemption story. It's a picture of the recreation of what we see in Genesis when God takes the dust of the earth and he forms it and then he breathes the spirit, the breath of life into his creation. He says, and I will do it again. It's not just for the exiles. That's for us. That whatever, whatever circumstance or situation, season that we're in, it may seem like it's over, this is the end, it's done. God says, no, no, no. You have a future hope. And I can breathe air into dry bones. I can bring life out of death. It's not over. You have a future hope. The second prophet is Daniel. And we've looked at him a lot in this series. Obviously, the book of Daniel we've spent most of our time in that. Daniel, as we've talked about, was probably about 17 years old when he was taken away from, from uh, Israel, from Judah, from Jerusalem. And he spent the rest of his life in Babylon in captivity until he was probably in his late 80s or early 90s and he died in captivity. Well, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel gets a vision, another vision. Now, I, I will say this. The book of Daniel is not necessarily laid out exactly in chronological order. If you were here with us last week, when we were in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den, he was probably 83 to 85 years old. Daniel 7, this vision, he's probably 70 years of age. So it's a little out of order chronologically. But in this vision in Daniel chapter 7, he has like this Isaiah experience. You remember when Isaiah was in the very presence of God and he was high and lifted up and his throne filled the temple and there was thunder and there was smoke and all these cherubim going about saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and is and is to come. It is this incredible thing. Woe to me. Daniel has a similar experience. He sees God and he refers to him with the title, the ancient of days the ancient of days, the one who is eternal, the one who is everlasting, the one who has all wisdom and all experience. And he begins to talk about the holiness, the burning holiness of God and the power of the ancient of days. And he sees this one. A little side note, this has nothing to do with sermon, but this is so cool. Just for a second. You remember Daniel's name meant God is my judge. In Daniel chapter seven, verse 10, it says, and the court was seated and the books were opened, like a courtroom sitting. 
It's like, this is so cool because Daniel says, God is my judge, and now it's happening. He sees him in the courtroom. Okay. So he sees the Ancient of Days. And then he gets a glimpse of another one, a, a one that is different, a, a one that would be not just for the exiles, but for all humanity. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Now, let's stop. I'm going to stop quite a bit in this, in this passage. Like a son of man. Some of you are aware of this. Son of man was the title that Jesus used to describe himself more than any other title. 81 times in the New Testament, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. And it has kind of a double meaning, a double reason why Jesus would use that title. One is because he's the incarnation. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is one of us. He is completely human. He is a son of man in that sense. But from Daniel chapter 7, one who is like the son of man and yet was coming with the clouds of heaven, had this divine nature. In the Jewish mind, the title son of man coming from Daniel 7 was this messianic one who would come. So when Jesus would refer to himself as the son of man, he would say, I'm one of us. I'm one of you. I'm human, but I am the Messiah. The one that Daniel saw. The one that you have been waiting for for 500 years. The one that Israel has been waiting for for thousands of years. I am the son of man. And Daniel gets to see Jesus. This one who is like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority. The Son of Man was given authority. What does it say in Matthew 28? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus would say. And Daniel got to see that. He had a, was given authority and glory. Glory. I mean, in Jer John chapter 17, when Jesus prays this high priestly prayer right before he's crucified, and he starts that prayer and he says, God, I have glorified you, now glorify me, with the glory I had with you before the earth began. He has all glory, not just the glory and the sovereign power in John 13, before he washes the feet of the disciples. It says that Jesus knew that all things were under his power. Daniel got to see this. Long before Jesus was ever incarnate on the earth, he saw the son of man who has all authority, all glory, and all power. And all peoples, nations, and men, men of every language worshiped him. Like in Philippians 2 where it says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Daniel saw it. This man, this son of man with the clouds of heaven, with all authority and glory and power and everyone worshiping him. And this is what it says about this one. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. A kingdom that would never be destroyed. Daniel knew the history of the kingdom of Israel. He knew that 400 years earlier, after Solomon died, with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the kingdom was divided and it would never go back to its glory days. He had heard about 722 when the Assyrians came and demolished the ten, the 10 tribes to the north. He was taken in exile when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroyed Judah to the south. He had seen kings and kingdoms rise and fall. He had served under Nebuchadnezzar and Darius Cyrus and Xerxes. He'd seen Nebuchadnezzar be the most powerful man on the face of the planet and then become an animal and then rise again. And yet this one has a kingdom that will never end. And the message of hope to those who are in exile in a different kingdom, and the message for us is that you're a part of an eternal kingdom an eternal kingdom that will last, that will go on. Maybe it was that understanding that allowed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stand their ground in their convictions, even if it cost them their life, when they said to Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow down to the idol because the God we serve can save us. And even if he does not, we're not going to bow. Why? Because we don't care about that kingdom. 
We don't care about that. We have a greater king and we're a part of an eternal kingdom. And even if you throw us in the fiery furnace, we're still a part of that kingdom. Maybe it was that resolve that caused Daniel to say, listen, Darius, I don't care what the decree says that if I pray to anyone else besides you, I will die. I'll be thrown into lion's den. I better go pray about that because I don't care so much about Darius and the kingdom of, of Babylon. I'm a part of an eternal kingdom. And all throughout scripture, we see this. Jesus in John chapter 18, when he stands before Pilate and Pilate says, who are you? Explain yourself. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. First Peter would write and he would say, we are aliens and strangers in this world. So we are stranger than others, no doubt. But we are aliens and strangers in this world. Philippians chapter three, verse 20, where it says, our citizenship is in heaven. Listen, I am grateful to be an American. I love our country, but my citizenship is in heaven, first and foremost, and my loyalty is to the kingdom that is eternal. No amens there, apparently. <laughs> Rough crowd. This is not a political rally, obviously. <laughs> I love our country, but there's a kingdom that will go on long after the United States. It's the kingdom of God. Maybe it's that understanding that has allowed God's people to endure the hardships and the difficulties of life in this world. The slaves that were treated so inhumanely, the horrific tragedy of that caused them to sing of a different kingdom. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. Gone home to be with God. I'm a part of a different kingdom. Swing low, sweet cherry. Take me home to a different kingdom. You know, we have brothers and sisters across the globe who still face death for following Jesus. Again, I'm so thankful that we live in a country where we can gather like this to freely lift up the name of Jesus to read his word without any worry about being arrested or killed. But that's not the case across the nations. Last year in Nigeria, 5,014 people were killed because they're followers of Jesus. And I hope it doesn't happen, but there may come a day when we don't enjoy the freedom that we enjoy today. I'm not trying to be a sky is falling. There may come that day but the truth is this, even if that day comes, we're a part of an eternal kingdom and it will prevail. The writer of Hebrews writes these words, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. The word from the prophets for the exiles, the word for the prophets for us. You have a future hope. You're part of an eternal kingdom. The third prophet is Jeremiah. We've looked at him a few times as well. Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. And most people believe, though it's not written in the book itself, most people believe that Jeremiah not only wrote the book of Jeremiah, but also wrote the book of Lamentations. It fits the setting, it fits his style, it just seems to make most sense. In the book of Lamentations are five poems, five poems of lament where there's just this emoting, this venting, this complaining, this pouring out of the, the circumstances. It's a very, it's called Lamentations. It's a very uh, sad book. But in the middle of it, in Lamentations chapter three, there's one little spot of hope. Lamentations chapter three, that spot of hope is, is prefaced with a little more despair. Chapter three, verse 19, Jeremiah writes, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And when I do, my soul is downcast within me. And Jeremiah thinks back over his life and the situation and the conditions that he's experienced. He never wanted to be a prophet. 
fact, if you read in Jeremiah chapter one, he's kind of arguing against God. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm not your guy. I'm just a child. And God says, I've got you covered. Some commentaries believe that Jeremiah may have been 17 years of age when he started prophesying against the kings and the nations. And the problem is, while he was being obedient to what God had called him to, and while he was speaking the truth, it was not well received. It wasn't just ignored. It wasn't just rejected. They gave him bodily harm and abuse for the messages that he would send. You want to see how bad it was? Read Jeremiah chapter 20 when he just, again, he, he speaks the words of God. He's just the messenger. He's just the mouthpiece. And instead of people saying, thank you for sharing the truth, he's put in stocks and he's beaten and, and he's abused yet again. And then he just gives his complaint and he says to God, you deceived me, God. This is awful. When I speak your words, when I'm obedient to what you called me to, this, they ridicule me, they abuse me, and that's what I, if I don't speak what you've called me to speak, it's like fire within my bones. I feel like I'm gonna explode. And he comes to this conclusion. I wish I would have never been born. Cursed be the day that I was born. The day that my mother bore me, he says. The guy who went to my dad and says, hey, his son has been born to you. They should have slapped him instead of me. When I was born, I wanted to be like a groundhog, see my shadow and go back in and die. I don't, I don't want this at all. My birthday ought to be a cursed day. Pretty dark. And not only that, but what had happened to Jerusalem when he had warned and he had shared and he knew it could have been avoided. And it's possible possible that if he was 17 years old when he started prophesying it's possible that he may have been really close friends and maybe some of his closest friends were taken into exile that maybe he grew up with Daniel Hananiah Mishael and Azariah Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego he was left in Jerusalem. And what's left of Jerusalem? The temple's been destroyed and defiled. The walls have been knocked down and they're vulnerable. All the great buildings of the city have been burned. The neighborhoods have been trashed. And on top of that, all of the leadership has been taken away. There's no one to lead. They're floundering. All the craftsmen, all the artisans, all the skilled uh, laborers, they've been taken. You, you can't find a plumber to save your life and the morale of the people. And this is where he lives. And when he tries to speak the truth, he gets abused and ridiculed. No, no wonder, he says, I well remember these things. And when I do, my soul is downcast within me. And then he makes this statement. And this statement Man, for some of us, we just need to put it on a three-by-five card for our mirror, our dashboard, our sink. He says the, these words. Yet, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. There's something that he remembers, some truth that he brings to his thinking. The situation hasn't changed. Jerusalem is still fallen. The exiles are still gone, and they're not coming back. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. And this is the only glimmer of hope in the whole book of Lamentations. And for 2,500 years, it has brought encouragement. And for many of us, many of us raised in church our entire lives, these words have impacted us. It says, this is what I call to mind. This is what brings me hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. My circumstances are not what I would want. The situation hasn't changed. Everything is pretty horrible, and when I focus on all of that, my soul is downcast with them. Yet, when I call this to mind, I have hope. It was words to give hope and encouragement and resilience for those in exile. And it's words to give us hope as well. That you serve a faithful Lord. 
all of his life, every day had been difficult, but every day God had been faithful. Every day his mercies were new. When he focused on all the external things, yeah, there was this heaviness, there was this downcast spirit, and yet when he would call to mind the truth about God, he would have hope. Last week we talked about Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, the horrible situations they had in the, in the concentration camps. And she said this, when you face an impossible challenge in life, if you look around, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look up, you'll be at rest. And you remember what she went through. You look around, you look within, but if you look up, this I call to mind. You know, one of my favorite passages, and I know I quote it all the time, but I just so love this out of 2 Corinthians 4. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen? Because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Cornwall Church, I want to tell you this. Our hope is not in a political party. Our hope is not in a candidate. Our hope is not in the stock market. Our hope is not in lower interest rates and higher 401ks. Our hope is not in technological breakthroughs or medical advances or scientific discoveries. Our hope is in this, that we have a future hope because we're part of an eternal kingdom and we serve a faithful Lord. Amen. That is where our hope is. And we will call that to mind. That will bring us hope. And even if things on this earth, in this life, never pan out the way that we hoped it would. Some things never change. We still have a future hope. We're still a part of an eternal kingdom and we still serve a faithful Lord. I'm gonna close with a story that you've probably heard before. A woman was diagnosed with a terminal illness and given three months to live. She asked her pastor to come to her home to discuss her final wishes. She told him which songs she wanted sung at her funeral and what scriptures she wanted read and which outfits she wanted to be buried in. Then she said one more thing. I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. The woman explained, in all my years of attending church, socials and potluck dinners, I always remembered that when the dishes of the main courses were being cleared, someone would inevitably say to everyone, keep your fork. It was my favorite time of the dinner because I knew something better was coming, like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie, something wonderful. So I want people to see me there in that casket with a fork in my hand and wonder, what's with the fork? <laughs> then I want you to tell them, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. Friends, that's the hope that we have. That's the hope, that there's a future hope for us. There's an eternal kingdom that will never fail. And we serve a faithful Lord. Call that to mind.